The Luxor Pyramid is now a staple of the Las Vegas Strip. Its black colored glass and giant light beam shining vertically into the sky are a well-liked sight for many nowadays. Though, its history is one that has been pretty bumpy, went against its original intention, and has now been rumored to be up for a potential demolition. Luxor actually started out with the name Project X back in 1991. At the time, its parent company, Circus Circus Enterprises, was the most financially sound and well-loved of the casino stocks by Wall Street. William Bennett had turned Jay Sarno's wacky original Circus Circus into a well-oiled machine, a place with cheap rooms, buffets, and small-time players who would keep the cash flow rolling in, which it did for decades. With the expected expansion of the Strip in the 1990s, CCE kicked things off with another new family-friendly and low-cost casino resort, Excalibur, which was a massive winner for the company, coming in on time, on budget, and with massive profits. The Luxor was scheduled to be the third strip casino for Circus Circus Enterprises and really the crown jewel of the middle market. Out of the three, the original Circus Circus was to continue to fulfill the need of the lower end of that market. Excalibur was a step above, sort of the middle of the mid-tier casinos. Then, Luxor was intended to serve the higher end of the middle, or as former CCE executive Bill Paulus put it, at Circus Circus Las Vegas, we do almost no room service business at all. At the Excalibur, there is limited room service. At Luxor, we will have a full room service menu. The opening of the Mirage in 1989 set the standard on the true high end of the market. At a total cost of $730 million to build, quickly making back $200 million in its first year. Meanwhile, Excalibur had cost CCE $290 million and had been a smash hit with $85 million for its opening act. The success of both of these resort casinos at different price points would help to set off an over $12 billion building boom on the Strip over the coming years. Luxor would be a more luxurious place than the other CCE properties, while still delivering the company's famous value. As one executive is quoted, the overall feel that you will have is that you have entered a luxury hotel, but the rooms will be between $55 and $70. The approximate average daily rate will be $60. The intention for CCE was to go head to head with two other new casinos which were scheduled to be completed around the same time, MGM Grand and Treasure Island. The Circus Circus formula of entertainment plus value equaling profit was to be put to the test once again in a tougher environment, but with the anticipated growth of the strip in the 1990s, that profit slice was going to be bigger than ever. Project X was going to be Egyptian themed and entirely funded by the company's cash flows without adding debt to the balance sheet. In the book, High Stakes, Inside the New Las Vegas, you get to read how things were shaping up for the project in 1992 and what type of place it would be. Quote, the hotel would have 2,500 rooms and 90,000 square feet of casino, all kinds of state-of-the-art technology, exotic scenery, artifacts, a full-scale replica of King Tut's tomb, and the River Nile running through the interior. Along with this, there would be three technologically advanced rides, each with its own stories and experience, but also interconnected in story with the other two theme park style attractions. There would be three sections of the casino, the past, present, and future, with a ride representing each. The plans kept getting bigger and more grand. Seven restaurants were in the works, and the famous light beam at the point of the structure would literally top things off, with potential visibility all the way from Los Angeles. As another executive remarks in High Stakes, Once we designed that atrium, we kept seeing the advantages of an enclosed environment and it kept getting bigger and bigger in our design. I thought, why don't we use all the money we're spending on the rooms and on this glass atrium and use the rooms to actually make the shape of the atrium. The Luxor ran over its budget by $100 million, with the tally at opening coming in at a total of $400 million. However, those first two years were hugely successful, with the first fiscal year bringing in 90 million and followed it up with another 86. An estimated 8 million people visited Luxor in the first year alone. Thrilled with the focus on the ride entertainment, technology, and lining up to take a reed boat down the in-house Nile River. However, this original formulation would change within a few short years. Legendary CCE leader Bill Bennett was forced to step down in 1994, mostly due to the cost overruns of the Luxor. He would be replaced by a new management team that would take Luxor in a new direction. Now that Bill Bennett was out of the way, his value-focused style wasn't what the new management wanted to pursue. Sure, Luxor was doing well, but it could do better. With some changes in style and renovations, perhaps it could compete in the higher end of the market. Bennett hadn't ever focused on the high rollers who came to the Strip. He also didn't like or want to go after the convention market, two areas which would now be a target for the new look Luxor. The upgrading of Luxor would begin in 1996, just three years after opening. This year saw the profit total drop to $65 million with all the renovations taking place. In today's dollars, the company wanted the Luxor to cater to people making the equivalent of 100 to 120 grand a year. They could fetch a higher room rate, attract some high rollers, and get the Luxor generating well over $100 million a year in profit. The target was 120 to 150 million in profit once the new changes were completed. Casino business veteran Tony Alamo was put in charge of making it happen. The rides, the Nile River, and what guests saw when they entered the casino would all need to be changed. 
With the original build, the casino was invisible from the entrance. Lines for the Nile were clogging up space and the flow of everything took guests away from the casino floor. The rides themselves were profitable, but they didn't generate repeat business as most riders only went on them once each. Thus, getting rid of them could prove to generate more money with a greater expansion of the casino floor space, more slot machines, and the introduction of higher limit tables. Beyond that, Luxor didn't have a successful show or nightlife venue. The restaurants weren't to the quality of the other higher-end resorts and they didn't have enough luxury suites. A problem which would be solved by constructing two new towers and adding over 1,900 new rooms within them. These new additions would bring the Luxor total to over 4,400, making it the biggest hotel in the country at the time. Also, they needed a new theater to actually host shows, which would eventually become a 1,200-seat venue. Hotel guests were now greeted by a replica of the Temple of Ramses II, which led right to the casino floor. This would be a major facelift for the young resort and casino. Once again, construction costs would go way over budget. The initial show that the Luxor hosted wouldn't pan out, and once things were nearing completion, the crowds weren't exactly breaking down the doors in the first few months. Things did start looking up by the spring of 1997, as Pete Early writes in his book, Super Casino. On an average night, the hotel was running out 98% of its 4,407 rooms at a rate of $90 per room. That meant that the hotel was contributing more than $300,000 every night to the resort's earnings, and 70% of that was profit. Though, that would be the peak of a pretty choppy year overall. The new restaurants were opened, along with the nightclub, Ra, that would later be replaced in the next decade by LAX. Luxor finally got its successful show when the Blue Man Group arrived in 2000 for its first run at the resort. Renovations at the Luxor were not fully completed until 1998. By this point, the casino had been open for five years and circumstances on the Strip had changed. Now, going after the higher-end market meant more competition that wasn't around back when this new plan was undertaken. Bellagio was opened in 1998. The Venetian followed in 1999. Heck, even CCE's own Mandalay Bay opened in that same year. Thus, Luxor was already the second option within the company. It's not difficult to see just why Luxor wasn't gaining the sustained level of traction that it was supposed to during this time period. While I liked the place, I don't think I would ever have chosen to stay there versus Bellagio and the Venetian, especially in those early years. And you can bet, most of the wealthier clientele wouldn't have either. To this point, consider that Bellagio did $244 million in gross revenue during its first 77 days of operation alone. But that's not to say that the renovations were a total failure. They weren't. Luxor still brought in $97.6 million in 1998. 1999 was an improvement from there, with the new Luxor attracting plenty of crowds and repeat customers. CCE was renamed Mandalay Resorts after the Mandalay Bay opened that year to its own fanfare. Growth was in the cards for Mandalay Resorts outside of the 2001-2002 travel dip after 9-11. By 2003 though, the company was bringing in record profits. During this time, there were plenty of quarters where Luxor's room rate was well above $100 per night and even in the 120 range. I wanted to try to put together every year of income for the resort, but I couldn't find complete information for many years in the early 2000s, which can be tough for a company that no longer exists. Mandalay Resorts was acquired by MGM Mirage in 2004. From what I've been able to gather, the high watermark of Luxor most likely came in 2007. That was the first year I have a new separate operating income for Luxor alone. Also, MGM Mirage revenues were rising in this 2004 to 2007 period, so it's almost certainly the best year that Luxor had. You can see the dramatic decline that the hotel and casino faced after the 2008 financial crisis. From $132.42 million of operating income in 2007, down to just 18.82 by 2010. From there, it grew once again, but never achieved the same heights before the disastrous year of 2020. Taken as a whole, it's tough to consider Luxor a complete failure. I mean, if it does get torn down, I guess it's not a complete success either. Both Circus Circus and Caesars are still standing, along with Treasure Island and MGM Grand, both of which were supposed to be Luxor's initial competition. By that metric, I guess it's the least successful of the three. Plus, when all of them were under the MGM Resorts umbrella, both TI and MGM routinely brought in more revenue, in MGM Grand's case, by a wide margin. The construction and the first renovation cost a total of $850 million, each coming in way over budget. Then, in 2008, they were set to spend another $300 million on renovations, which, as far as I can tell, MGM Resorts went through with. So, $1.15 billion was spent on various construction over the years. During the 2007 to 2018 stretch, operating profits were right around $650 million. With what I can gather about the 1993 to 2006 years, Luxor has pretty easily turned a profit over its lifetime but with a pretty low rate of return. I figure somewhere in the two to two and a half billion range of lifetime operating profits. 
which is certainly something, considering you could have thrown a dart at a board of US stocks since 1993 and almost certainly gotten outperformance with whatever it landed on, it's not too much to write home about. Since 1992, Vanguard's total stock market index fund has returned 10.5% Per year. Luxor was designed to compete in the mid-market, then tried to move up in weight class. Unfortunately for the Pyramid Casino, a new generation of higher-end joints were coming online between 1998 and 2007. It just couldn't compete, especially when Wynn, Palazzo, and Encore came along. It might have just been better to leave much of the original design intact, remove the rides, and make smaller upgrades. Then just let Mandalay Bay serve the higher-end customers on its own when it was completed. But that's not what happened. Luxor is now stuck with its themed architecture from the early 90s boom, with an identity that has undergone different iterations in a Las Vegas strip in the middle of rather uncertain times in the 2020s. What becomes of it, I don't know. Though, it is a place I've always had a fondness for.